In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Christ is in our midst. He is in our shelter. It's so good to see all of you, especially for those who are coming for the first time after almost a year, and for all those who are praying along our side from home. Thank you very much for all those who participated throughout the week with the prayers that we had. We cannot pray by ourselves unless it is for the entire community praying along our side. The church is not the same, and it's not built on one person or two persons. It's built on the entire community and all of us standing together and praying along our si alongside each other. Today, you will notice that the service that we're going to have is a little bit different, so I want to give you a heads up so that you are in the know about the changes that are happening today so you can feel more comfortable following along and praying and that it's not something uh, coming from somewhere else but from our faith, from our long-standing faith. So today you will notice that we are going on the first Sunday of Lent. The prayer that we're going to do, the liturgy that we're going to pray, is the liturgy of St. Basil the Great that the church ordained to have on the fir first five weeks of Lent that will change when we get to Palm Sunday and the uh, Paschal service. But for the first five weeks of Lent, five Sundays of Lent, we do the liturgy of St. Basil the Great, and these are five times out of the ten times altogether that we serve this liturgy throughout the year. This liturgy has the same backbone as the liturgy we serve on usual Sundays, which is written by St. Basil, John Chrysostom, uh, but this one is a little bit longer. The difference is in the parts that the priest is praying. This comes from a time around like the 4th, 5th century when St. Basil himself was living. So he is another giant of the church, and I invite you to contemplate on the prayers that you're going to listen to today and try to integrate them so that we learn from St. Basil himself how to pray ourselves even today. The second thing that you will notice today is the first Sunday of Lent, and it is known as the Sunday of Orthodoxy. Uh, most of us might think about it as, and you will hear some of the words like the triumph of Orthodoxy, the triumph of the true faith, and these kinds of expressions that seems as triumphalism, something that we are so proud of in a way that might seem degrading or demeaning of other groups of people, our other faiths and other denominations. But actually, if we dig deeper a little bit into what this day means and where it comes from, it comes from a day from uh, the time of, uh, from the 8th and 9th century, right, way before the separation between the Roman Catholics and the Orthodox and the Protestant. So this was an emphasis on what the Christian faith itself means where we restored the place of icons in our worship because we believe in the very first place that our Lord Jesus Christ is the incarnate God and because He took on a human body, we are able to put Him on icons and we don't worship the icon itself, but we worship the person that is represented on that icon and I mentioned this example a few times before. If you kiss a picture of your child or your mother or father, does not mean that you are worshiping the piece of paper that their picture is on, but you're actually sending that love and that adoration to the person who is depicted on it. So again, the risk of thinking about orthodoxy in terms of triumphalism makes it a little bit risky for us because we might uh, pit ourselves against others and we find ourselves in animosity and hatred toward those who did something wrong in the history of our faith, but we forget about what is the true meaning of our faith and why we adore the icons. So it is very simple because we all are made in the image and likeness of God and the image in English that translates an icon so every one of us is actually made according to the icon of Christ, and not only those who follow Christ himself, but also every human being is actually 
created according to that icon of Christ that is imprinted in them whether they know it or not. So this understanding might change the way we perceive ourselves and the way we live our life and the way we interact with other people whether we know them or we don't. So frankly, if you think about it this way, if I know myself as the son or daughter of the king, I'll probably behave and live my life in a different way than if I thought I am a son or daughter of a slave. That totally different perspective about my role in life and who I am and how I interact with other people. So when we come in, in front of those icons that in, in a few minutes at the end of the service we're going to proceed with these icons, we will notice that these icons are silent icons. Not only that they adore our building, but we hold them up and we go and they are silent presence of something that is beyond them. A silent presence that will give us hope and hopefully by really integrating the idea that we ourselves are the icons of Christ, we can be this silent presence, but silent as much as it is hopeful and it's inviting and it's compassionate because it refers to the initial act of God himself taking a body in order to invite us back to where we originally belonged. Also, at the end of the service, we will do this long announcement about all the people who kept the faith and those who went astray away from the faith and those who had heresies. And again, it might remind us of a sense of triumphalism that we are the right uh, believers of Christ and everyone else is wrong. And we may go out and try to fight with other people and convince them and argue with them that Christ, the one that we believe in, is the right one. While actually, through that long list of people, we tend to overlook the, the scores of people who died because of their faith, who were silent icons to the point where we don't even know how they lived. We, there are so many of our sa saints that we celebrate every day we know so little about their lives. So in a way, they were these silent icons through two millennia that kept the faith for us to live and have this intimacy with God. So even their lives, we, when we mention them, they were not apologetics. They were not out on the streets just preaching Christ and telling people you are wrong and you are right. They were silent icons that were present in the world and where their presence was enough to convert the world to become Christians. So let us take today and the entire journey of Lent to remind ourselves and now when we go out with the procession with the icons and I hope that all of you brought the, your icons from home to remember that not only the icon of Christ is imprinted in you, inside you, and that this is your ideal that you are holding in your hands, but also it is imprinted in everyone else who is around you. And in a way, that's an invitation for all of us to treat them as Christ being present in them. But because, frankly speaking, the big challenge that we are going to face is the one that we heard in the Gospel this morning in passing in a way, but it's a reminder that we are the ones who are meant to listen to this gospel. When Philip told Nathaniel, come and see, he did not have any argument, he did not have any proof that this is Christ, but told him, come and see. And at the time, it was easy because Christ himself was there. He was able to convince Nathaniel that I am the Son of God. But today, our challenge is much harder. When we invite a stranger or a friend to our community, and we have so many of them passing by our church during the festival, for instance, but, um, or the bazaar, but the, when they come in, when we invite our friends, are we able to show them the icons on our walls only, or do they, are they able to see the icon of Christ inside us and in the way we treat each other and those who are around us? The challenge is big because when we claim that Christ is in our midst, 
are those strangers able to notice that Christ is actually in our midst? If we are behaving as if the icon is inside us and inside everyone else, those strangers are able to notice that Christ is in our midst. I pray that we all will continue this journey of Lent and that we strengthen each other by praying for each other, by standing with each other with compassion and care, so that at the end we all rejoice by seeing the risen Lord from the dead. Amen.